This is week 21, half past paper, and we're doing the higher tier, and this is a calculator paper this week. These are all the topics that we're going to do on this paper, so inequalities and so on, right up to changing the subject to the formula and finding error intervals at the bottom. You've got the Sparks codes on the right if you do have access to Sparks, and how many marks each question is worth. It's 80 marks normally on a full paper. We're doing 42 marks today, all of the odd numbers of this paper, so perfect for a little bit of revision. Okay, question number one. Write down the inequality shown on this number line. So we've got our circle over the minus 1. So we can see that we need to use the letter x because that's the labelling on the graph there. And x is all of the numbers that are bigger than minus 1. Like that. Now we need to decide is it equal to or not. And that's decided by whether it's coloured in. So if that circle was coloured in, I'd be saying it's equal to. But because it's an open circle, we're just saying x is greater than minus 1. Part B, on the number line below, show the inequality. Y is bigger than or equal to minus 3, so we need a circle above minus 3, and less than 4, so I'm going to put a circle above 4, and I join those together. Where they're limited at each end, we don't use an arrow like we did here. We just use a circle at each of the places and then connect them with a line. And we are going to colour in this minus 3 one, because we can see at this end it can actually equal that value. So if it's equal to, you can colour it in. So there we go, two marks for that one. Question number 23. Sam drives his car on a journey. Here is the travel graph for the first 15 minutes of his journey. The distance travelled in kilometres is up the side here and the time is going across the bottom here. Work out Sam's speed in kilometres per hour for the first 15 minutes of the journey. Well, speed is distance divided by time. We know that from our formula triangle. Speed is distance divided by time. So in the first 15 minutes, that's the line that's drawn there, he travelled 20 kilometres, and we're going to divide that by the time, which is 15 minutes. Now, if you do 20 divided by 15, it's not going to get you your speed in kilometres per hour. It's going to get you speed your speed in kilometres per minute. So you can do it that way if you want. I personally would rather divide by a quarter, because 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour. Okay, so 20 divided by a quarter is going to get you... 80. So that makes sense. If you're going 20 kilometers in quarter of an hour, your speed is 80 kilometers per hour. So 20 divided by a quarter would do that. When we divide by a quarter, it's the same as timesing by four. If you preferred to do 20 divided by 15, you would have got uh, four thirds as your answer in your calculator. And then you just need to take that and times it by 60 to get it in um, per hour. So that would also give an answer of 80, just a little bit longer. So if you can get it in hours, then it's just a little bit easier. You could divide by 0 0.25, or you could divide by a quarter, and um, that would get you 80 straight away. At 10.15, Sam stops for 10 minutes, and then drives for 20 minutes at a speed of 75 kilometers per hour. On the grid, complete the travel graph. Okay, so if he stops for 10 minutes, he's not gonna be getting any further away. So I'm gonna get my ruler here, and I'm gonna do 10 minutes going straight across. Now each box is five minutes on this graph. So for 10 minutes, I'm doing two squares like that. He's then driving for 20 minutes at a speed of 75 kilometers an hour. Now let's look back at this. If his speed, is 75 kilometers an hour and the time is 20 minutes which I'm going to say is 20 out of 60 or a third because it's a third of an hour I'm going to times those together to get the distance that's going to help me so 75 times by um, a third that is going to be 25 kilometers that he's going to travel in that time okay so if you go 75 kilometers in a whole hour in 20 minutes, you would only go a third as much, so 25. So you could just do 75 divided by 3. You could also do 75 times 20 minutes, but then that answer is going to be in minutes, so you're going to need to then divide it by 60. So 75 times by 20 is 1,500, and then if we divide that by 60, we also get 25. So... Um, 1,500 divided by 60 is 25. So it's absolutely fine to do it that way as well if you prefer, but 25 kilometers is the distance. So let's now go back to having my ruler and it's gonna take 20 minutes, so that's four squares, five, 10, 15, 20, and I'm gonna go 25 kilometers is the distance. He's already at 20, so we need to go up to 45 and over four squares. So one, two, three, four, 
and we're going up 25 so that's going to go to there we're going from 20 to 45 yes there we go that's where it goes perfect so that's the rest of your graph lovely five marks for that one question number 25 here is a right angled triangle the shaded shape below is made from two of these triangles work out the perimeter so the perimeter is a distance all the way around the outside you need to do this add this add this add this little bit add this and that's going to give you the perimeter the distance around the outside of the shape so hopefully you can see that we need to work out this side over here and how can we work that out we can use pythagoras so i'm going to do eight squared add 10 squared. I'm adding because I want the longest side, the hypotenuse. 8 squared is 64 and 10 squared is 100. 100 add 64 is 164 and then we just need to square root that answer to find the length of that side and that is 12.8062 dot dot dot. Okay lovely. So I know that this side here is 12.8062. What about this bit here then? Well, I know that this, all of this side here, is that same number, 12.8062. And I know that this side here, because it's the base of that triangle, is 10. And therefore, the difference here is 2.8062. If I take away 10 from 12.8062, I get 2.8062. So therefore, we've got those numbers to add up. To get the perimeter, it's going to be 8, add 8, add 10 add this, add this. And I'm not adding together anything on the inside because perimeter is only the distance around the outside. So 12.8062, add 2.8062, add 10, add 8, add 8. Now try not to round any of your answers until you get to the end. If you can, always do a good few decimal places. I get for that, so let's put 8, add 8, add 10, add 12.8062, dot, 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 add 2.8062, dot, 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 equals 41.6124, and that's to three significant figures. So there's your first significant figure, there's your second, and there's your third. Always check the next number. In this case, it's a one that so rounds down. So 41.6 is going to be my final answer for four marks there. Question number seven, and we've got liquid A has density of 1.8 grams per centimeter cubed. Liquid B has a density of 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. So before I begin this question, I'm just going to do my formula triangle up here. Remember that is density, mass, volume. That's gonna help us with this question. Now, a lot of students like to do this in a table. I personally like to draw the um, cups of liquid. So I've got liquid A here, liquid B here and we're mixing them together to get liquid C. So in my head this makes the most sense laying it out like this. Each of those liquids has a density, a mass and a volume. Now you can mix masses or you can add together masses. So if you add a mass and a mass that mass is going to increase and you can do the same with volumes. If you add volumes together that volume is going to increase. You can't add together densities, okay? Density is a compound measure. It's made up of two separate measurements, and so we can't add those together. So here what we need to do is work out the density of liquid C. This is what we're trying to work out. Let's put a question mark there. And to do that, what we need to do is get all the other values so we can work out what's missing. So liquid A has a density of 1.8, so let's pop that there. Liquid B has a density of 1.2, let's put that there. And we've got 80 centimetres cubed of liquid A. Now centimetres cubed, that is a volume. So 80 there and 40 there. And we can add that together and it also says it in the question, the volume of liquid C is going to be 120. Great. So to be able to work out the density of C, to be able to get this value here where we've put the question mark, I'm going to need both the mass and the volume of C. So if we can get the masses of A and B, we can add those masses together to get the mass of C. So how do we get mass? Well, let's cover up the thing we want to know. So covering up the M for mass, we're left with density multiplied by volume. So if I do 80 times 1.8, that's going to get me the mass of A. Using my calculator, this is a calculator paper, that is 144, and that would be grams. Units always match up for these. So if you're working in grams per centimetres cubed, and you've got volume in centimetres cubed, then the mass is going to be in grams, and they always need to match up, and if they don't, you'd need to convert them. Okay, for B, I'm going to do 40 multiplied by 1.2, and that is 48 grams. 
And so we know that if we add those together, 48 add 144, I've got 192 grams for here. So if I want the density now for C, covering up the density, I'm left with mass divided by volume. So that's going to be 192 divided by 120. And that is 1.6 grams per centimetre cubed. Makes sense. We can see that it's between the two densities, somewhere in the middle, but we did put in more of density of liquid A, sorry, so that makes more sense that we were slightly closer to that one. Okay, question number nine. The box plot shows information about the length of time in minutes some people waited to see a doctor at the hospital on Monday. Work out the interquartile range of the information in the box plot. Not sure why that S is there, sorry. So interquartile range is the upper quartile, that value there. Take away the lower quartile, that value there. This line here is the median. We don't need that for this question, well for this bit, we're just going to do the upper quartile, take away the lower quartile. So the interquartile range is the size of that box, if that makes sense. So your upper quartile, we need to look really carefully at the scale here. So I've got 160 to 200, so this is 40 over 10 squares. That means each square is 4. So if I go 4 on each square, I'm going back by 12 here. 200 take away 12 is probably the easiest way of doing it, I think. Um, however you get it, that is 188. So my upper quartile, take away lower quartile, upper quartile is 188, and the lower quartile here, we know that's 44, 48, and half a square is going to be an extra 2, so that is going to be 50. So take away 50. 188, take away 50 is 138, that is my interquartile range. Okay, Becky says 50% of the people waited for at least two hours. Is Becky correct? Now we can see that 50% is where the median would be. And the median is indeed at 120 minutes. We can see that there. So therefore, yes, 50% of the people waited more than 120 minutes and 50% of the people waited less than 120 minutes, which is two hours. So yes, um, 120 minutes equals two hours and is the medium. So 50% waited longer and 50% waited less time. Oh, my handwriting got progressively worse then. Sorry about that. There we go. Waited less time. Perfect. The table gives information about the length of time in minutes some people waited to see a doctor at the same hospital on Tuesday. So what we had up here was Monday and here we've got Tuesday. Becky was asked to compare the distribution of the lengths of times people waited on Monday with the distribution of the lengths of time people waited on Tuesday. She wrote people had to wait longer on Tuesday than on Monday. So she's saying the people on this day waited longer. Well, let's have a little look. It says, uh, give one reason Becky might be wrong. So first thing I'm always going to check is the median. The median is an average of how long people waited. And on Tuesday, we can see they waited 100 minutes on average. And on Monday, we know already because we did it in this question, it was 120 minutes. So actually on Tuesday, on average, people were waiting less time. Yes, the longest time might be higher. So 210 minutes was higher than the 200 minutes, which was the longest on Monday. But the average is a pretty good measure. So we could just go on the average and say that she's wrong. So give one reason Becky might be wrong. Uh, the medium on Tuesday is lower. So on average, people waited less time on Tuesday. So that would go against what Becky has said. Okay, question number 11. Here is a sketch of the line L. The points minus six zero and zero three are points on the line. The point R is such that PQR is a straight line and P to Q, Q to R is in the ratio two to three. So we're saying that there are two sections here and three sections here, all equal despite my dodgy drawing. So we've got two parts and three parts. So we're saying if we split that line up into five sections, that is how it would be split up. Find the coordinates of R. So first let's have a little look. How much have we gone across and up over these two parts here? Well, we've gone six across and three up. So that means each little jump, if this is six across and three up, we can say that each section goes three across 
and 1.5 up because I'm just halving that. So three across, 1.5 up, three across, 1.5 up. So therefore this is three across 1.5, three across 1.5, three across 1.5. Each of those sections must be the same. So three across 1.5 up, three across 1.5 up and three across 1.5 up. If we're starting at zero three and we're going across three, six, nine, then we're going to go across to 9. So 9 is going to be the x-coordinate of that r. In the y direction, going up, I started at 3, and I'm going to add 1.5, 1.5, and 1.5. So that's going to go up to 7.5. You can, of course, go from here as well. I just thought it would be easier to go from q, given that we were already partway along that line. So there we go. 9, 7.5 is your answer to that one. Each part of my ratio is, if you did it like this, like I normally do for ratio, each of these parts is three across and 1.5 up. And each of those is that. So that's how I got that answer. Find an equation of the line that is perpendicular to L and passes through Q. So if we're going perpendicular, first we need to get the gradient and then we need to do the negative reciprocal. If two lines are parallel, they will have the same gradient. If they're perpendicular, we need to get the gradient and do the negative reciprocal. Let me show you what that means. So if I know that this line at the minute, the line L, goes from, uh, what was it, minus 6, 0, and it goes up to uh, 0, 3. That was the other point, wasn't it, that they gave us. We can get the gradient of this line by doing rise over run. So how much has it gone up by? We can see it's gone up by 3 from 0 to 3. And how much has it gone across by? It's gone across by 6. So rise over run is 3 over 6, which is a half. So the gradient of L is a half. If we were going parallel to that, we'd want another line with a gradient of a half. But if we're going perpendicular, we do the negative reciprocal. The negative reciprocal is we're going to make it negative. If it was negative, we'd make it positive, but it's positive, so we're going to make it negative. And then the reciprocal is when you invert that fraction. So, for example, 3 over 4, the reciprocal would be 4 over 3. Uh, 2 over 5, the reciprocal would be 5 over 2. If you're starting with a half, it's going to become 2 over 1, which is just 2. So the perpendicular gradient is going to be minus 2. Therefore, we know the equation of this line is y equals minus 2x plus c. We don't know what the y-intercept is yet, but we know that it needs to go through q. Oh, there we go. So we do have the y-intercept. Let me just clear that. I've made a bit of a mess of that. So actually, if we're going through q, we know that it's going to be crossing the y-axis at 3. So we don't really need to do very much work there. They've basically told us that this number is 3. So my final answer is y equals minus 2x add 3. Question number 13. In a school, there are 16 teachers and 220 students. Of these students, 120 are girls and 100 are boys. One teacher, one girl and one boy are going to be chosen to represent the school. Work out the number of different ways there are to choose one teacher, one girl and one boy. OK, now this is the product rule for combinations. So if there are 16 teachers, first we're going to pick a teacher. Then we're going to pick a girl and then we're going to pick a boy. We want to know how many different ways we can do that. Well, there are 16 teachers to pick from. So 16 times by 120 girls times by 100 boys. And it is as simple as that. So we're just timesing those together. 16 times 120 times 100. And that is 192,000 different combinations for two marks. Question number 15. Here is a triangle ABC. Find the length of BC. So here we have a non-right angle triangle. If your triangle does not have a right angle, that is making you head towards cosine or sine rule. Okay, Socrates and Pythagoras would be in a right angle triangle. If it doesn't have a right angle, we're probably going to end up using cosine and sine rule. And we're fairly far through the higher paper now, so that makes sense to be using this at this point in the paper. Find the length of BC. Now, I've got two sides and the angle in between, and I want this side over here, and that is the perfect setup for the cosine rule. So cosine rule is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos capital A. Now, they've actually labelled this for us perfectly, but they might not. Okay, so little a is always going to be the side that is over from the angle. Capital A, that is going to be the angle, and that's the only capital letter, so that has to be my angle, and it is capital A there. 
and then over from capital B is little b, over from capital C is little c. So there we go. It's actually labeled correctly. But if it isn't, don't be scared to relabel it or just to go with it as it is. Okay. So a squared is 8 squared add 11 squared minus 2 times 8 times 11 times cos 72. And I'm just going to type that in my calculator. And once I've got that answer, remember that you're getting a squared when you get that. So if you're getting a squared, I then I'm going to need to square root that answer to get my final um, answer for a. So 2 times 8 times 11 times cos 72. And that gives me 130. So a squared is 130.613009. Now that doesn't make sense if it's got 8 and 11 as its other sides. So square root that answer. And that gives us 11.4286 three significant figures, so 11.4 would be my answer there for that other side. Okay, it then says find the area of triangle ABC. Area is given by half AB sine C. So we're going to need to change the letters here. I need that capital to be my angle. So let me just draw this triangle out again. I've got 72 degrees up here, and this is 8, and this is 11. Was it that way around here? Yeah, it doesn't matter, but there we go. So 8 and 11. So I'm actually going to relabel this. This is going to be my little a, this is going to be my little b, and this will be capital C. So a half times 8 times 11 times sine 72, and that's going to give me the area. So again, we can't do base times height divided by 2 because I don't have two perpendicular height uh, lengths. Sorry. So half times 8 times 11 times sine 72, and that is 41.846, blah, blah, blah. Three significant figures would be 41.8, and that's your answer for those two. Well done if you got that um, cosine rule at the top there, and half a b sine c, area of a triangle at the bottom. Question number 17, and we've got a histogram. So the most important thing to remember about a histogram is the area of the bar is how many people are in that category, okay? So have that in mind as we're reading the question. Some people took part in the first round of a competition. The histogram gives information about the scores of these people in the first round. 20% of the people got a score high enough for them to qualify for the second round. Work out an estimate for the score needed to qualify for the second round. Okay, let's work out how many people there are, because then we can work out what 20% of those people are. So what we're going to do is the area of each bar. Now, these are just rectangles, so you're just working out the area of the rectangle. The base, so for the first one, is 5, and the height is 0 0.8. So if I do 5 times 0 0.8, that is 4. So there are 4 people in that category. For the next category, 5 to 15, it's got a base of 10 and a height of 1.6. 10 times 1.6 is 16. So there are 16 people here. For the next one, I'm doing 10 times 2.2, which is 22. For the next one, I'm doing 15 times 1.2, 15 times 1.2 is 18. So there we go. That's all of the people. Adding that together, 18, add 22, add 16, add 4, is 60 people. So 60 people all together, and 20% of 60, 10% is 6, so 20% is 12 people. So I would like to work out where the top 12 people were. Now remember, this is the top 12 people because they're getting a high enough score to qualify. So there are 18 people in this last category. We know that. Where would I need to split it to get an area of 12? Well, it's got a height of 1.2. So I need to come back by 10. So putting a line here is going to leave me with an area of 12. It's an estimate because we don't know for sure that all that it's um, evenly distributed throughout that category, but it's a fairly good guess. So I'm gonna say that a score of 30 would have 12 people above it. So 12 people means a score of 30 and above. So 30 would be my answer for that one. There we go. Right, question number 19. A, B and C are three spheres. The volume of sphere A is 125 centimetres cubed. The volume of sphere B is 27 centimetres cubed. The ratio of the ratio to B to C is, of uh, the radius, sorry, is 1 to 2. Work out the ratio of the surface area. So this is asking you about linear scale factor, area scale factor, 
and volume scale factor. We know that they are different. And we've also got A, we've got B, and we've got C to worry about here. Okay, so the volume of A to B is 125 to 27. So 125 being A and 27 being B. Okay, great. So the volume scale factor is the ratio between those, 125 to 27. Now, luckily for us, they're both cube numbers, which is great, because if I cube root both those values, I will get the linear scale factor. So cube rooting 125 is 5, and cube rooting 27 is 3. So therefore, I know that the linear scale factor, the lines, the ratio of the lines between A and B would be 5 to 3. And the ratio of the areas, to go back this way, we would square that. So the ratio of the areas is 25 to 9. Okay, so that's all of those filled out. It then says the ratio of the radius of B to the radius of C, so that's, uh, they are lines, they are lengths, is 1 to 2. So I'm going to need to put another B column in here because the Bs are going to be different. So B to C is going to be 1 to 2, which means if I square those values, I get 1 to 4. And actually, this is what we're interested in, isn't it? We're, we don't need to work out the volumes because we're interested in this. Now, if I want to compare those, I'm going to need to make the Bs the same. So to make the Bs the same, I'm going to make this one 9. And I can do that as long as I also times this one by 9. So sorry, I should have said to get from there to there, I just squared those values again. So I'm going to make that one 9. So the area scale factor of A to B to C is 25 to 9, but if I've made B9 here, this one is going to be 36, because I've times it by 9 as well, so C would be 36. It then wants the ratio of the surface area of A to the surface area of C, so this to this, so my answer would be 25 to 36. Um, it doesn't say simplify, not that we can, so that's all good, 25 to 36 would be my final answer there, quite a tricky one. So that is scale factors. Last but not least, question number 21. The time period t seconds of a simple pendulum of length L is given by the formula t equals 2 pi multiplied by the square root of L over g. Katie uses a simple pendulum in an experiment to find an estimate for the value of g. Here are her results. Now she's rounded these, so this is a bounds question. L is 52.0, correct to three significant figures. Now, three significant figures for this question is actually the same as one decimal place. They've actually rounded to the nearest 0 0.1. So if I write nearest 0 0.1, you're going to half that, and therefore we know we're going to put 0 0.05 above and 0 0.05 below to get the biggest and the smallest that value could have been. So for L, it could have been 52.05, or it could have been 52, 51, sorry, 0.95. That would be up the upper and lower bounds for L. For T, we're going to do the same thing, except for T, it's been rounded to the nearest 0 0.01, because again, that's where your third significant figure is. If we divide that by 2, we get 0 0.005 and 0 0.005. So we're going to go that much above and below. So that's going to be 1.455 and 1.445. There we go. That's the upper and lower for that. Work out the upper bound and the lower bound for G. Use pi as 3.142, okay? You must show all your working. So to get the upper bound and the lower bound of G, first thing I'm going to do is rearrange this formula because I actually don't have G as the subject to the formula at the minute. So to do that, let's start with T equals 2 pi multiplied by the square root of L over G. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is divide by the 2 pi. So T divided by 2 pi is the square root of L over G. Let's get rid of that square root by squaring both sides. So T squared over, now don't forget if you're squaring 2 pi, that's going to be 4 pi squared equals L over G. And then I want that G to be on its own. So I actually need to multiply the G up. So I'm going to write G T squared. We can times this up here and times this up here because the equals is in the middle. So 4 L pi squared, and then divide by t squared. So g is 4L pi squared over t squared. There we go. So I've now rearranged that formula, and g is now the subject. Now, if we want the upper bound for g, then I'm going to use the biggest L that I can 
but I'm going to use the smallest T because if you want to get the biggest answer, you're going to get the biggest number on the top. You're going to divide it by as little as you can. You don't want to share it with very many people or very much stuff. So G upper, we'll just put a little arrow there, is four times the biggest L, 52.05 times 3.142 squared over the smallest T, which is 1.445 squared. For G lower, we're going to do the same thing but the opposite ones, so 4 times 51.95, which is the smallest value of L, times 3.142 squared, can't change that one, over, and then I'm going to divide by as much as I possibly can to make that answer as small as I can. So dividing by um, 1.455 squared. Okay, typing both of those in my calculator, Let's get each of those values. Okay, so there we go. That's both of those worked out. So I've got my upper bound to be 984.3677853. And I would write all of those decimal places because it's a bounds question and I want to be really clear in my answer. And for the lower bound, 969.018164. There we are, four marks for that. And that is 42 marks altogether. So just over half a past paper. That was all the odd numbers this week. We will do all the even numbers of the same paper next week um, for week 22. So join me then. I hope you found it helpful. And let me know in the comments if you've got any questions at all. I'd be happy to help.